Reynolds began by speaking about how our conceptions of subjectivity and identity have been changing in relation to the forms of surveillance that we're seeing on the streets as anti-racist uprisings break out in the United States and around the world. And even before that, as we use Zoom and participate in new forms of telepresence that implicate us in broader surveillance networks. Some years ago, I was working at an arts nonprofit in New York and writing about art that sought to represent and resist the kind of militarization of everyday life that was part of the so-called war on terror, especially the expansion of drone warfare, mass surveillance, and biometric technologies like facial recognition. I became dissatisfied with a tactic that many prominent artists relied on, usually summed up in the phrase, making visible the invisible. The idea was that the NSA, the CIA, the entire surveillance apparatus of U.S. empire remained unseen, Edward Snowden's revelations of mass surveillance notwithstanding, even as they watched our every move. And to speak truth to power, these secretive agencies have to be exposed. The result, so often, was art that replicated the maneuvers of the surveillance state at a technical level, while trusting that once people knew, the system had to change. In my view, there's a lot of technologically complex and in many ways masculinist art aimed at heroically thwarting surveillance or outwatching the watchers that places too much faith in visibility. It does so at a number of levels. First, such art presumes that making power visible is itself an act that changes political consciousness. Second, it implies that surveillance actually operates primarily at the level of the visual and not via other senses and modes of data capture. Third, it implicitly claims that visibility and transparency are desired political relations, that it is important for identified subjects to make demands on the state. Fourth, and most importantly, it assumes that the conditions of visibility or invisibility are, if not neutral, then not radically different according to race, gender, class, geography, and citizenship. Around the same time, the concept of opacity started to gain purchase among many artists that were challenging surveillance, and particularly its gendered and racialized manifestations. At one level, opacity is a tactic of counter-surveillance, Think of either IRL masks and protests or digital acts of masking, remaining anonymous and untraceable online. At another, it's a political vision and strategy against the dual meanings of representation, political and aesthetic, and the way these meanings are intertwined in the conventional liberal democratic belief that for marginalized people to be represented as constituents of a body politic, they need to be seen, heard, understood, as human, as normal. To be clear, I don't want to discount this idea entirely or undermine the social and political gains for LGBTQ people, for immigrants, for people of color that have been made under the sign of visibility. But we have to question the terms on which the oppressed become visible. The right to opacity, as Edouard Bisson articulated it, challenges us to think about how legibility, visibility, and representation can be as reductive or violent as invisibility and exclusion. What's important is not simply to make visible, but to transform one-way visibilities into intersubjective relations of seeing and recognizing. T to paraphrase the artist-scholar Kocho Ashun, what if, rather than speak truth to power, we turned our backs to power? One can debate whether what we're experiencing now, as I read to you across time zones in a delayed video, actually constitutes telepresence or merely telecommunication. Media studies scholar Chris Paulson parses various definitions of telepresence in an excellent book called Here There, Telepresence, Touch, and Art at the Interface. There she discusses a range of definitions of telepresence. She writes, Telepresence is the feeling of being present at a remote location by means of real-time communication devices, with a screen as the mediating surface, the interface. But she also argues that to be telepresent, one has to affect a remote environment, not simply apprehend it. The relation to a distant place has to be haptic, i.e. based on touch, and not just communicative or visual, i.e. based on hearing, speaking, seeing. 
Consider the perspective of the drone pilot who testifies to feeling 18 inches from the battlefield, the distance between the eye and the screen. In an article probing the proximities and distances enabled by drone warfare, scholar Derek Gregory reports that when a research visited a U.S. Air Force base in Nevada, quote, he was told, inside that trailer is Iraq, inside the other, Afghanistan, end quote. As Gregory writes of this encounter, quote, the effortless sense of time-space compression is exceeded only by its casual imperialism, end quote. I want to consider this disturbing virtual proximity and corporeal invulnerability to imperial violence through a genealogy of visuality in which the predator is associated with an objective, distant viewer that gradually becomes more distant from his prey. If the assemblage of the military drone acts as a portal for imperial policing across the planet, however, I also want to think about how telepresence can open up to other, more just worlds. The novelist Arundhati Roy wrote an essay at the peak of the COVID-19 lockdowns, or one of its early peaks, the future may reveal, arguing that this pandemic, like those before it, has forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. Roy presents the reader with a choice of what beliefs and visions to carry into that portal, suggesting that the way we step into an uncertain future will determine where the portal leads. I want to consider this question in light of what the activist and author Naomi Klein has called coronavirus capitalism, a moment of unfolding catastrophe in which we can accept the intensification of imperial logics or seek to render this crisis into a transition, a process of repairing the world we know, or indeed tapping into radical imaginaries to portal beyond it. In addition to the rise of Zoom, work from home, and new delivery services, COVID has led to a new moment for the non-military government or humanitarian drone, which is being deployed to warn people outside to go back into lockdown, to spray streets with disinfectants, to deliver medical supplies and other necessities, and to measure body temperatures. In theory, just as armed drones protect the soldiers that wage war from the safety of military bases, these drones are meant to protect healthcare workers. But the public health benefits are unclear. Research has shown that disinfection through aerial spraying is ineffective, and the fever detecting drones that would prevent officials from coming near potentially infected citizens are useless. Studies have shown that they can only measure body temperature within a five degree Celsius range. Evidently, drone developers aren't after the best public health solution. The point for them is to pitch their products at a moment when governments and nonprofit agencies are looking for technological quick fixes. This is a test run for their future profitability. It's a large scale experiment at a moment of emergency that corporations hope will normalize these technologies well beyond the emergency. The drones were ready for this moment, the New York Times recently announced, anthropomorphizing drones in an article that both normalizes their omnipresence and paralyzes action with its alarmist awe. So how can we think about this moment? In addition to worrying about repressive surveillance at a time of uprisings against police brutality and white supremacy, I want to emphasize we should take seriously the role of drone technology in eliminating jobs at a time of mass unemployment. The unlikely Democratic presidential candidate, Andrew Yang, limited as his political vision was, succeeded in mainstreaming the idea of universal basic income, UBI, within the United States. After dropping out of the race, he lamented that he should have run on UBI because of the threat of a pandemic, not that of automation. But it's really about how automation is accelerated by an event like this pandemic. Jeff Bezos, for example, has made tens of billions of dollars in the last few months alone, as people shop online rather than in stores, and because Amazon, even as its warehouse workers are exposed to frighteningly unsafe and exploitative conditions, is at the forefront of the drive toward automation, developing services like Prime Air, which promises to deliver products by drone within 30 minutes of ordering. 
themes of telepresence in labor and telepresence in warfare and policing, which are increasingly the same thing, are explored speculatively in the visionary film Sleep Dealer, directed by Alex Rivera in 2008, which presents a matrix-like virtual world undergirded by real-life exploitation. More historically specific than that blockbuster dystopia, however, Sleep Dealer opens onto an American continent in which workers in Mexico are cybernetically connected to jobs in the United States. As protagonist Memo is told when he first links into a construction site north of the border, quote, this is the American dream. We give the United States what they've always wanted, all the work without the workers. Sleep Dealer assumes that the U.S.-Mexico border has been fully sealed. Physically impermeable from the South, the United States can only be accessed virtually. So when Memo gets plugged into a construction job in San Diego, it's thanks to nodes he purchased from a coyote a clever play on the coyotes that currently help Central American laborers cross the border illegally. Blue and white collar workers alike are made into cyborg subjects of this sort. The immaterial labor of Luz, Memo's love interest, also depends on nodes. A blogger of sorts, her video stories are directly uploaded from her brain. Sleep Dealer also hinges on drone warfare and its televisual representation. The film imagines a cops-inspired show, Drones, which dramatizes the pursuit of racialized terrorists from the perspective of U.S. drone pilots represented as, quote, patriotic heroes. That becomes significant in the film because Memo's home is near a water reserve that has been appropriated by a U.S. corporation. When he and his father try to take water for themselves, they're branded aqua terrorists and pursued by a U.S. drone, which kills his father, leading Memo to seek remote work in the U.S. as a cyborg. The film ends, in a way I won't reveal, by suggesting, perhaps too optimistically, the possibility of mobilizing military drones for anti-capitalist, anti-imperial resistance. We can connect this ambivalence about the potential uses of drone technology to Donna Haraway's landmark cyborg manifesto. For Haraway, cyborgs emerge from a history of domination, but they can betray their origins. She writes, quote, the main trouble with cyborgs, of course, is that they are the illegitimate offspring of militarism and patriarchal capitalism, not to mention state socialism. But illegitimate offspring are often exceedingly unfaithful to their origins." End quote. She's arguing against a Luddite or anti-technology position and for a socialist feminism that thinks about who cyborgs will be and how they slash we can responsibly construct relations with others whether those others are machines and networks, plants, animals, or any other organisms. If one perspective regards the cyborg as a product of a militarized capitalist state, and another views the cyborg as a liberated hybrid subjectivity, Haraway writes, the political struggle is to see from both perspectives at once. Like the cyborg, the drone is a technology with militarist and capitalist origins that infuses every domain of life. With Haraway and others, I want to ask then, can the forms of telepresence and altered perception the drone enables be repaired and reconstructed towards new forms of relation, ones that don't replicate imperial visuality and racialized modes of seeing? Considering the transnational developments of military technologies, it's important to remember what M.A. Césaire calls the boomerang effect. Together with Hannah Arendt and other political theorists and anti-colonial thinkers writing in the mid-20th century, Césaire was asking how a horror on the scale of the Nazi Holocaust could have happened. This question provoked an inquiry into how ideologies and technologies of racism and extermination that had been developed by European settlers and administrators in the colonies for so long came back, boomeranged, to the imperial center and were applied to Jewish people as well as to Roma, 
queer people, communists, and other dissidents. Today, we can speak of the boomerang effect in terms of military technologies that the United States has used in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere, coming back to U.S. internal colonies, mostly black and indigenous areas within the United States, such as Baltimore or Compton or Standing Rock, where technologies specifically developed for surveillance and warfare have returned home and been gifted to police departments. But we can't conceive the boomerang effect as a unidirectional or singular movement from empire's peripheries back to the colonized communities at its center. Rather, we should examine the spectrum of imperial technologies and perspectives developed and distributed in multiple directions since European colonial expansion and its waves of expulsion, genocide, and slavery, together with its formations of new racial hierarchies of the human going back to 1492 and 1619.